Welcome to the Holston Valley Unitarian Universalist Virtual Church. My name is Bradley, and I'm glad we can get together, even though we cannot be together. Today, our guest speaker, Eric Bannon, back once again, talks to us about world changing and your role in that. Good morning. My name is Eric Bannon. 
and I am here today to challenge the myth of powerlessness with my sermon, World Changing 101. One thing we all experience is change, but we all experience it differently. But it sure can be stressful, especially now with all the uncertainty surrounding us. It's, you know, it's the big changes, like life transitions, that seem to stress us out the most. A job change or a job loss, man, that's a tough one. Our children, our children are born, they grow up, they head off to school, kindergarten, middle school, college, high school. They leave home, they come back. Many of us are caring for aging parents. Many of us are aging parents. You know, my father passed away back in 2016. He was 90 years old. He was the last of his generation in my family. That was a tough one. And this is not to mention all the scary stuff that's going on outside the walls of our church today. Wars, floods, oppression, strife, hatred, pandemic, injustice, racism. Many of these things can make us feel powerless. But what I really want to get to today is to talk about the small changes in our lives, the ones that we have some control over on a day-to-day -day basis. These can help us prepare for the big changes. So let's explore how the things we do every day can contribute to larger social change. And I know, I know how easy it is to get immobilized with all the bad things happening in this world. All the, all the noise on the TV, in the newspaper, um, don't even get me started about the internet. It can make us feel powerless. So let's hit the pause button on all that noise for a minute. If you want to live in a world where people take care of each other and that's what you're doing, that matters. Not only are the people around you benefiting from this, but you are modeling this behavior for others to see. You are changing the world for the better. We take care of our children, our life partners, our friends, Many of us are involved in the care of aging parents. This matters. This is a movement that I want to be a part of. Now, I lead worship about 20 Sundays a year, and everywhere I go, I hear people say they feel powerless. I have this conversation a lot, even over Zoom or even on YouTube. And when I have the same deep conversation over and over as I travel about, I feel like the universe is calling me to do something like write a song or maybe a sermon like this one right here. So let's talk about that. Let's talk about the big changes. Let's talk about social change, changing the world, if you will. Mm. Now, Big change takes a lot of the day-to-day -day work we've been talking about. Now, I'm not talking about fixing the world. I'm talking about making it better. If I was talking about eliminating all of the conflict, strife, and injustice in the world, well, yeah, some groaning and some eye-rolling would definitely be in order. Now, I know some of you spend most of your waking hours engaged in the struggle for justice. Some of you may feel torn by other commitments that prevent you from doing something you feel you have a passion for. Some of you may not know what to do. This question of what is mine to do is a big one. People talk about callings. Now, you may think you have a calling, but the truth is you have hundreds. So how do we figure out what is the next right thing? I'm gonna put a bookmark here. We're gonna come back to this question of what is mine to do. And I'm gonna tell you about a friend of mine. His name is David Lamont. 
Now, I first met David in 2004 at the Swannanoa Gathering, a folk music camp that um, it's a, I use as a retreat for my songwriting. I go every year. Now, David, at this time in 2004, was in the midst of a successful career as a singer-songwriter. He'd been traveling the world. He played over 1,500 concerts. He liked to joke about he hadn't had a haircut or a real job in 20 years. Now, along the way, he founded a nonprofit organization that builds schools and libraries in Guatemala. Now, David had always felt the calling of social justice and peace work. And in 2009, he received the prestigious Rotary World Peace Fellowship. He then walked away from his career and moved to Brisbane, Australia, Brisbane, <laughs> with his wife and infant son to pursue a master's in international studies focusing on peace and conflict re resolution. Whoa. Now, when David first walked away from his career to pursue peace work, the most common response he got was something like this. Oh, peace work, huh? <laughs> Good luck with that. Now, as a culture, we have some commonly held beliefs that working to change the world for the better is somehow naive. Just look at the world, the skeptics cry. People have been trying to end war and poverty for centuries, and the world is still riddled with it. And the lesson drawn from this is often, you can't change the world. Well, Now, David and I stayed in touch, and when he got back to the States, to the U.S., after finishing his master's, he worked with the North Carolina Council of Churches and served on the Nobel Peace Prize Committee. Now, David is a vegetarian, so one day we decided we were going to go to lunch. And we were having lunch at the Irregardless Cafe in Raleigh, and over Indian vegan tofu chili, which is much better than it, much better than it sounds. He told me about this book he was going to write called World Changing 101. Huh. Now, David and I agree that we, that's us, that's me, you, that's everybody, are changing the world just by living in it. And one day in 2014, I walked up the drive to my mailbox and there was a signed copy of this book, World Changing 101 by David Lamont, Challenging the Myth of Powerlessness. Notice the bullet holes in this sign. We get a lot of that out where I live. Now, I've read this book more than once, okay? I've taken a highlighter to it. To many sections, I have a song called Stumbling Towards the Light that was inspired by it. Now, and I have a whole case of these books. If you like one, like one, just let me know. I'll send you one. Every church should have one of these in their library. One of my favorite ideas from the book was the heroes versus movements as competing narratives for social change. Let me say that again. Heroes versus movements as competing narratives for social change. Now, David illustrates this, this contrast with a look at the story of Rosa Parks. Now, the hero version of the story goes like this. Mrs. Parks, a seemingly powerless little old African-American lady who had made a spontaneous decision not to give up her seat to a white man on a Montgomery bus in 1955, literally changed the world with her courage. Hmm. The, in this version of the story, large-scale change happens when an extraordinary individual takes dramatic action in a moment of crisis. The problem is fixed, the threat is removed, and the credits roll. Now, this hero narrative is deeply ingrained in our culture. I mean, who hasn't che cheered for Superman or Wonder Woman? or Bruce Willis in Die Hard 6, or Rocky. 
there's one little problem with the hero narrative. It is simply not how large scale social change happens. Now here's the movement version of this story. And some of you listening may know this story better than I do and better than David does. Okay, so bear with me. Rosa Parks had already been an activist for 12 years by the time she was arrested. Okay, she was the secretary of the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. She traveled to a training camp at the Highlander Folk School the summer before she was arrested, where she took classes and spent time with legendary activists, Septima Clark and Miles Horton. Mrs. Parks had been extremely active in the struggle for years before she was arrested. Her decision was not a spur of the moment flash of courage, but a result of long considered convictions and many years of work. Training and practice. The day to day work of social justice. This is what we've been talking about. That famous photo of her being fingerprinted that pops up when you Google Rosa Parks arrest was taken at a subsequent arrest in 1956 when many of the Montgomery bus boycott leaders had been arrested when the boycott was deemed illegal under Alabama state law. Now, when the boy, while the boycott was going on, people still had to get to work. So the organizers worked with donated vehicles, hundreds of private citizens, and local black taxis to make sure everybody could get to work. Think of all these folks whose contributions, no matter how small, were a part of this movement. Driving someone to work, making lunches, babysitting kids of drivers, working the phones, big change made up of lots of small changes. Rosa Parks volunteered as a dispatcher. She was working the phones when she was arrested. Rosa Parks working the phones. She showed up, she brought her joy, and she did the work. Movement narrative says that large scale social change is brought about by movements. Many people taking small actions that contribute to a larger shift. This narrative is more truthful and it invites us to see the small things that we do every day that matter. Okay, I'm gonna shift gears again here. Um, in August of 2016, I attended a world-changing 101 retreat led by David Lamont. And at the retreat, Davis, David led us through this wonderful little exercise in taking action. Now, we got some paper and pencil, okay? So if you're watching this at home, you can just pause it right now. You can pause the video and go get yourself a piece of paper and a pencil, okay? And he led us through this little exercise. Okay, step one, answer some questions here. No, step one, what's bugging you? Or better yet, what's bugging you today? The corollary of this question is, what inspires me? Step two, what do you love doing? What are you good at? What are your gifts? Number three, where are your people? Community matters. And we generally come up with better ideas when we work them out as a group. Remember, it's movements that make big changes. It's been much harder lately with quarantine, but it won't last forever. Now choose, what is one small thing you can do this week? How can you step toward this thing you care about in some small way? Something manageable, something attainable, small things. Now write it down and do it. 
Now, at the retreat, we were advised when we actually did that one small thing to put that piece of paper on our refrigerator in celebration or perhaps burn it with a prayer of thanksgiving. Now, we're not done yet here. Step six, repeat. Doing that one small thing is a big first step. We went from being passive to being activists. Ooh. Now, this was very helpful for me. It gave me a framework to consistently work through being overwhelmed and figure out what is the next right thing. As an artist in this world, that's a really big deal. Now, this process, it's challenging in many ways. I don't, I don't mean to make it sound easy. Now, David also gave me some advice, gave advice for all aspiring activists. And I'm going to quote David directly here. He says, no one has the authority or the knowledge to tell you what you are or are not called to do. These are deeply personal questions. <laughs> if you feel a tug to engage in ways you haven't before, to reach outside of your comfort zone, that may be something you want to pay attention to. And he goes on to say, what is not yours to do may be almost as important as what is yours to do. Hmm. Now, I came here today to challenge the myth of powerlessness. It's my hope that I've at least made a dent in it. I know how easy it is to get discouraged and overwhelmed by all that's happening in the world. This can lead to feeling immobilized as if there's nothing you can do. But think about where we are right now. Being here together in community, we are changing the world. Even if it's, even if it's online, even over Zoom, we can feel each other. We show up. We bring our joy. We do the work. We bring our sorrows and our burdens here as well. We are here for each other when things get tough. We sing. We laugh. We cry. We show up. We bring our joy and we do the work. May you all be inspired. May you all be inspired to bring what you love to the service of this world. Amen. Thank you. And may this be so. Hi, Eric Bannon here. Thank you so much for tuning in. Maestro Glenn on the piano. We're going to do a, a traditional hymn, Wade in the Water, with lyrics I learned from folk singer, storyteller, Reggie Harris. Made it through. God's gonna 